two writers. One just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome back to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast with Mark and James. And this week we're going to be talking about foreign rights, how to get your book published abroad, uh, particularly into other languages. And also going to explore a tricky area that uh, affects quite a few people in the indie space who started off in the traditional world of trying to get their rights back from uh, traditional um, publishing houses, particularly houses that may have gone bust and may have sold the rights on to somebody else or they've been acquired in a merger and um, you feel that your book's just been lost and not being promoted anymore and you'd love to get on and do it yourself. Tricky and difficult area, but Orna Ross gives some good advice on both those subjects. So, yeah, we're, um, we're fans of Orna, of course, the Alliance of Independent Authors, which I... Um, Uh, very openly say I think it's a good thing to join I think it's a good thing to support the organization there a bit like I suppose a union um, in one so they're kind of a a, a pressure group to represent independent authors a union in every positive sense as well as I know union can have negative connotations but um, they can be they can be a positive force for good as well so so speaks the conservative (laughs) uh, the small c Um, yeah absolutely and they're um, uh, it's a great organisation. Lots of useful bits and pieces for authors, from I think legal advice to um, advice on agents and, and all the kinds of bits and pieces that you need to uh, wrap your head around when you're starting with this. And also, they do a really useful um, service where they'll um, they'll help kind of vet people, uh, providers, uh, to give them a clean bill of health, or if necessary, uh, they'll warn authors away from them, some of those predatory publishing houses that we've spoken about before, and I'm not going to name for fear of getting sued, but I think everyone knows who those people are. Um, and and the uh, the Alliance is really good at shining a light on some slightly dodgy practice as well, so it's a, it's a great place to make sure you and your money um, are, are, are kept safe and sound. Okay, let's hear from Orna. Orna, we want to talk about some areas that are, are are quite complicated, I think, for authors, a little bit daunting and frustrating uh, as well. Some of it's quite positive. We're going to talk about selling foreign rights. And also, I want to put a question to you that's come into us um, from a, a podcast listener about difficulties in obtaining the rights back when they've gone to traditional publishers in the past. Uh, but let's start with foreign rights. So should, this should be a positive story, really, because I think it's an area people perhaps don't even think about, certainly at the beginning of their careers. And yet it's something that's worth doing, right? Yeah. And really, it isn't something to think about right up at the front, except in, in the sense that you make sure you value your intellectual property. So the whole concept of rights is is only about 100 years old. It it really rests on copyright law. And copyright law is not something that is universal yet. It's it's only in some countries. So um, it's a complex area. And there is no doubt about it. And even within publishing, it's kind of viewed as like the dark arts. You know, what goes on down in the rights department is a mystery to everybody. And it's even more, I think, um, difficult to predict, difficult to, to, you know, be sure how to approach it than even the rest of, of, of the stuff. So I think it's not something to think about until you're already selling well in your own language, in your in you know in in English, in the English language around the world is the first thing to think about. And they are not in general rights to to give away unless you've got a well placed trade publisher who would give you perhaps a print only deal in a specific territory. Um, forget all about rights until you are up and doing well in your own language. Yeah, just just, uh, on, just yeah. on that point, or I guess there are yeah. some parts of the world where the ebook uh, hasn't taken off as well as it has here. So that might be worth doing. Actually, if there's a specialised print distributor who can look after distribution in a particular territory that you can't really access through Amazon and advertising. Yeah, I I think be very careful with your e rights would be would be my thought because I, I I feel that things are changing so rapidly in that space and you know there is so much work going in by the likes of Amazon, Google, uh, Facebook to get people 
you know, up on the internet and reading within the next number of years. So the thing about rights is that if people buy them, they buy them for a specific period of time. So if if it's a short term thing, an experiment, yeah, absolutely go for it. But you've got to be really careful with your contract. So your rights buyer will be trying to get those rights from you for as long as possible. And it's your job to try and and give them for as short as possible. So it's all about minimizing the territory and minimizing the time for you. And for them, it would be all about maximizing the territory and maximizing the time. So you're entering into a negotiation. Um, that's the first thing to realize as an author and to understand negotiation probably read up on negotiation skills and perhaps even take a course on it if you are actually going to enter this territory because you know it's like any salesperson um, or purchasing person who is very experienced at it and does it a lot they know how to do it and you likely as a as an author you know it's quite likely you won't have a clue and you'll end up giving away too much and it can really cost you down the line well that's as the basis the entire traditional industry has run for a couple of hundred years is that authors are authors aren't great negotiators i mean agents obviously make a big difference in that in the last uh, 50 or 60 years probably more okay so yes go on. yeah well i think you know it's what what has amazed us about it in self-publishing generally is how authors can get good at these things so you can start off not being good and and quite uncomfortable it's very similar to producing a book at first you you don't have a clue and every decision feels enormous and you know but slowly step by step you learn by doing and the next time you make a book it's easier and by the time you're on books or you're four you're not even thinking about these things you're just kind of tweaking and, and enjoying as you go. Next thing is is marketing and promotion in your in the English language. And at first it's I haven't got a clue and then you learn how to do it and so on. And so it's similar then with this. It's it's like another whole stage, another whole learning curve. And you're either up for it or you're not. But what's surprising about self-publishing, I think what has surprised everybody is just how many authors are actually up for the marketplace and do maybe even enjoy when they get stuck in, actually enjoy the the whole business side of things. So if you're that kind of person, it's well worth getting, you know, it's not a lot of skill actually compared to some of the other things you've had to learn to do. And it can be well worth upskilling in that zone. Orna, what's what's to stop somebody uh, paying to have the book translated into, let's choose Germany as an example, um, to perhaps get some ads translated into German and to run the whole operation in German in the same way that you'd run it in English? Absolutely nothing, um, except, you know, good old hard work and knowing how to do it and do it well. The thing is that outside of English, the ebook market is not very developed as yet. So you can see that as a problem or you can see that as an absolute opportunity. So if you look back at 2010 and, you know, when when Kindle started, say, two or three years into Kindle publishing, a lot of people in, in English did really, really well just by being there, just by being there and do, producing a good book with a properly directed cover, at, at, you know, directed at the proper market. You did extremely well in those days. Now, as we kind of develop other languages, it's it's going to be like that. So being in at the beginning could be a real advantage. So, you know, particularly now as we're seeing the, the growth of advertising and this model of marketing. So when, when it all started about 10 years ago, marketing was very much seen as social media and email, well, email marketing, I think is the one thing that really remains very, very strong. But social media and getting your book out there, developing a platform, you know, corresponding with your readers, producing newsletters, blah, blah, blah. And um, now there's quite a different, more data directed advertising related model that a lot of people are doing very well with. And with that model, it's very transferable. If you're trying to do, you know, translate your newsletter and translate your your platform and there's a lot more work and a lot more thought needed in that and you probably would need help from somebody, you know, who's a native speaker in, the, in that language. But when it's ads, it's it's very much easier, I think. Yeah. So um, I can see some people thinking they struggle as it is with the English side of things. So maybe there is a, a better option for them to uh, to 
to get the rights done. So, so if you've got your English language rights in ebook, you're dealing with that. You look at foreign territories. I mean, who? First of all, where would you start if nobody's approached you? How do you find somebody who could potentially distribute for you in those languages? It, it's very simple. It's email pitching. You know, so it's back to exactly what a writer would have done in the old days when you were pitching a publisher. So you need to put together a good persuasive pitch for a rights buyer telling them how to, you know, why they should buy your book and and publish it in their language. And the number one thing needs to be that you are already selling well. So there's absolutely, I, you know, I have people who talk you know the first thing they want to do is kind of as soon as they publish now they want to publish you know get somebody to buy their rights but you have to actually be selling a lot I mean the one thing you really need to know as an author is that rights buyers are inundated with material so there are a number of services in the self-publishing space that are offering to bring your book to Frankfurt Book Fair or London Book Fair or Book Expo um, in the US and, you know, put it in front of rights buyers. It, it doesn't work like that. It's quite a challenge to persuade a rights buyer to buy your book. Similarly, IPR license and PubMatch which are the electronic services that match rights buyers and rights sellers. While it's fantastic to have them and they're brilliant for research and finding out who is the right person to address your, your pitch to, just by putting your book up on, on those services does not mean that you're going it's going to be bought. And a rights buyer needs to be persuaded and they are most easily persuaded by sales. I mean, the sales thing has to be there as a number one and, and even and that may well not be enough. So what, you know, what sort of things are they looking for then? So somebody is um, you know, shifting, they're making a living out of it, and they're probably selling to the UK, uh, US, Canada, Australia, South Africa, perhaps the, you know, the big in- bigger English-speaking countries. What, are, what do you suggest you put in those, for, apart from your, to- your, your bottom line, I guess, what, in those first couple of lines in an email? You need to show an understanding of their territory and how things operate there. So Germany is not the same as Spain. Spain is not the same as Italy. Italy is not the same as, you know, South America. They all operate in very different sorts of ways. So you need to understand how your particular book fits into their ecosystem. And, you know, some countries like Germany is very strong on literary fiction, much, much stronger than the US, UK for example. Um, so, you know, and you need to, I, I guess, just, just, you need to do your research. That's the, the number one thing. If you want to get stuck into this and you want to enjoy it, you need to be the kind of person who enjoys researching the markets and and knowing what's kind of hot in different places. And it, it definitely helps to start attending book fairs with a rights hat on, you know, with a rights mentality and attending, um, you know, sessions and seminars about what's going on in different territories and how publishing is evolving there. So if you're not the kind of person who enjoys that, then probably this is not a place you're going to succeed. I'm, I'm guessing that be- we're going back to the negotiation here that because uh, rights buyers are inundated and even good sales aren't necessarily going to get you in the in the door, that the offers that come from them presumably are going to be quite stingy for authors. They they've got a lot of lot to pick from. Yeah, and y- yes, I mean they can start as low as one or two thousand um and then a really good rights deal is like anything in publishing it doesn't really have a ceiling it can it can get interesting because what happens with rights is is the cumulative effect the first one is the hardest so once you've sold in one territory that makes rights buyers sit up and particularly if you've sold if it's if you're selling now in two territories your own and somewhere else it's much, much easier to get that second sale and every subsequent sale gets easier and easier. So, you know, you go from it probably typically it would it takes maybe a year to get your whole right strategy set up and to get, you know, to pitch and find the right people. And, you know, that first sale is very difficult. But the second one usually comes a lot quicker. And then there's kind of a snowball effect so that you can find yourself selling in 
you know, 25 or 30 countries relatively easy, easily once that ball starts rolling. But again, I stress, I don't want to make this sound easy because this is a tiny percentage of authors who are doing this so far. But there are um, there are authors who are doing it. And, you know, we have a number of members and um, I should say that we have a guidebook to this whole thing, which is called How Authors Sell Publishing Rights. And we have a number of case histories in there, of people who've approached it in different ways. So the two ways to approach it is to go directly to the publishers yourself or to go to, to sub agents in the territory that you want to be published in so uh, people don't realize often that if you your local agent if you have an agent in say you live in the UK and, and um, you have an agent in London or whatever he or she will be using sub rights agents in other territories to, because nobody really has the knowledge of the entire rights landscape. So you work with other people and that's why they will typically take a higher percentage for your foreign rights sales than they will take for your local sales because the sub-agent needs to get their cut as well. So you can cut out the agents and go directly to publishers and we have a number of members who have done that or and or publishers start coming to you once that they've heard that you're selling. In, in other territories and that you're open to it. And you can, you know, set up your website to show that you are available for rights pitches and, you know, make sure that you let people know if you have sold and, and that kind of thing. Or you can approach agents in a territory and let them do the work and, you know, hand it over to them. So either way is acceptable. And I think there is a real opening here for somebody who would like to set up as a rights agent who would do that work on behalf of Indies. I, we don't really have somebody who does that. Uh, the Alliance is looking at um, working with a panel of agents. We have been working with one agent here in London over the last year, and that's been quite successful for some people. But again, different agents specialize in different genre and so on. It's very difficult to get one agent who has the reach. So it would be great to have a panel of rights people who just worked on behalf of high selling indie authors. I was going to say, one of the complexities you referred to somebody who might in the end have, you know, their book selling in 25 territories that's presumably 25 separate deals. I mean, there isn't, there's no go-to person who says, I do the rest of the world for you. Not really, no, no, nobody. And um, yeah, it's, it's time consuming, you know, there's no doubt about it. It's not something that you do without putting in the legwork. Yeah. Well, I'll talk to Mark off the back of this interview, and I know that he does sell his foreign rights. Um, you know, he sells well, obviously, in the UK and, and the US in particular, so that gives him a leg in, and we'll hear his experience of that. Uh, but we can't all be Mark Dawson, so I think um, it's uh, it's really good advice to hear, and quite sobering as well, I think, on, on this front. And timing might be an important thing. Build up those sales in the UK. Build up your proof, if you like, of the commerciality, the viability of your product, and that's ultimately in a negotiation that's going to mean more turning a spreadsheet around on your laptop to show your sales is going to be more important than anything you can say about how great the plot is yeah i think so unfortunately rights buyers i don't think they even read no <laughs> <laughs> no that's terrible i'm sure some of them do but uh, it really is a numbers game you know yeah. in that world and and it's good to be cognizant of that um, but, you know, having said that, all of this is changing and it's it's the slowest wing to change in the traditional publishing sphere. It is, you know, rights are even more conservative right, than other parts of the publishing sphere. So the main message I would give uh, to authors is hold on to your publishing rights when you get a contract of any kind from anybody, including a self-publishing contract, read the contract understand what you're selling you know and keep in mind that idea of limiting the territory limiting the time and um, always in a spirit of kind of exploring and experimenting with what works and we will see all sorts of unusual and wonderful things happening in this sphere over the coming years I think as we already are in, in the English language ebook sphere. Um, do you know of, of authors in the Alliance or, or elsewhere who have really cracked the foreign rights side of things, perhaps even outstripping their sales in, in the English-speaking world? 
I don't know anybody, you know, I wouldn't be able to say with authority that somebody has, has outstripped their say. I don't think it's possible because English is the language, you know, where everything is, is best and, and has been always, you know, to, to write in English is an instant advantage. But certainly we have some people who have um, cracked it and are very happy with how they've done it and as I say they've done it in different sorts of ways and you can read about those in the book actually yeah, um, yeah so well let's uh, you just just uh, give us the details for Ali uh, whilst we're on that subject or if people can get hold of the book we'd encourage people to join the Alliance of Independent Authors as well it's uh, it's an organisation that has your back um, in this uh, increasingly well, increasingly complicated world and changing world. How do people uh, join and how do people get hold of the book? Thanks, um, James. Yes, yeah, so we're at www.allianceindependentauthors.org and the book is called How Authors Sell Publishing Rights and it's available on all good online retail stores. We like that line. Um, so on this subject then, and we talked a bit, of, you, you mentioned a couple of times about in the negotiation, think about limiting how long your rights are gone for. We're finding a situation now, self-publishing takes off, I mean, really takes off. And as it becomes increasingly obvious, particularly to some formerly traditionally published authors that they have been paying to keep very large buildings in London going and actually if they have the rights themselves and they could be uh, energised to market them there is money to be made for them uh, in self-publishing there suddenly comes the tricky question of getting rights back now I know there's no single situation everyone's in a different situation we've had a few people contact us recently in some cases publishing houses have gone bust Uh, the dregs have been picked up by another publishing house and their book just sits gathering dust but writes legally with somebody else where do people start if they're desperate to get their rights back and get going yeah it's it's a difficult one because that initial contract is the one that you have to look at first so very often and particularly in older contracts um they didn't even think about ebooks you know so ebooks may not be in the contract but the language of the contract in actual fact will cover ebooks now if it was to come to a court case i think the first thing to say about about publishing contracts is it almost never comes to a court case so that contract is uh, you know after there has been a closure and a, a selling on to another publisher or you know hoovering up of rights by another publishing entity or whatever it's I would consider that contract as a discussion document rather than binding so the first thing you do is you send an email and you say you want your rights back under the new conditions and then a conversation begins so in always with rights and with contracts think of it as a conversation and a negotiation so you know be a kind of grown up about it don't assume the worst don't assume that you're right just because the piece of paper says something that that is in fact binding it can be replaced by another piece of paper uh, um, or an email that releases you so ask even when you get a no, ask again. So, you know, I was originally trade published. Fortunately, I had worked and um, done some work as an agent in a previous life. So I had a very good reversion clause. And that's the clause you need to kind of work with. So it usually comes at the end of your publishing contract. Have a look at it and see what it says. And also see, is your contract, does your contract cover ebooks? And also look at the sales. So typically the reversion clause was bound up with an out of print clause. So if your book was out of print for a certain length of time, it was no longer considered to be selling as therefore the rights reverted to the author. But of course, digital changed that because with POD or ebooks, it's never out of print. It's always available. So ask, be assertive, ask again, you know, have the conversation and do your very best to get it back. If it is an absolute refusal, though, the next step then is to say, okay, so how together can we get this book moving? What can I do with you to, you know, to 
to make it make it happen. It's our experience. We can help too with the alliance. You know, we do um, on behalf of our members. An email from us sometimes gets a more positive response than when the author is is just asking themselves. But um, the thing also, you know, it's there is no one answer to this difficult question, but begin to educate yourself about rights and how they work. It's not complicated. It's the legal language is a bit off putting at first, but actually, if you have the, the ability to write a book, you definitely have the ability to understand the publishing contract. It's just a matter of time and looking at it a little bit carefully and then going forward to be careful what you sign and to know what you're signing. Always know what you're signing. Yeah, I was going to say, so thinking about, you talked about the reversion um, clause. The guys who are signing contracts today then, so if the print thing, as you say, doesn't work anymore because of print on demand, etc. So what? how would you advise that get shaped if they're in, if an author's in a position now to say this is what I'd like in the contract what would it say being actively marketed by the company or, or sales dropping below a certain point maybe yes um, you, you need to have distinct and different um, clauses and you know um, what the sentences pertaining to the, the different formats so how they handle print how they handle ebook and audio should be you know differently outlined and in fairness most contracts have now been updated to that but only relatively recently you know uh, publish, trade publishing houses and some of the small ones probably still are putting out contracts that really are only talking about print books and there are still a number of trade publishers that don't actually do digital um it's 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 amazing but it's yeah. true <laughs> so yeah make sure that you now traditionally audiobooks were were seen as a subsidiary right in trade publishing for indies it's different for a number of indies audiobooks are actually number two and print comes in at number three and so for us it's it's a kind of a main right so you might want to just not go there at all with audio and but make sure that your e-rights and your print rights are treated separately and then put in you know you again are asking for what you would want so you would want to know if sales fall below a certain high level you want your rights back and they will say if sales fall below a certain low level you know and you meet in the middle you'll negotiate it out um that, I mean, the ultimate frustrating position I think somebody might find themselves in is a company has stopped trading, rights have been bought up, as I sort of painted at the beginning. They don't get any response from the new company who are not interested in them and not interested in the rights, and they just sit there in a frustrated circle where they can't even sit down and cooperate with them about getting sales going again. I mean, if nobody's actively doing anything with the rights that they have, is there any legal recourse you ever have to say... I need them, you know, because I can make a living from this and this is daft, you holding on to them for no good reason. You can send an email, you know, you, you first of all, you approach it as a request and then you request again and then you can, if you want to, send an email which says, you know, I haven't heard back from you, I therefore now consider that the rights have reverted and I'm going ahead and I'm doing what I'm doing. And, you know, I've known people to do that and it's gone well and I've known people to do that and it's given them a lot of stress. Uh, so, you know, again, it depends on the kind of person you are. It also depends on what is actually at stake and do you have somebody else who's likely to buy those rights or do you have a genuine good plan for exploiting those rights? Because the same thing happens to authors as happens with publishers that rights don't get exploited and that's for time reasons and resource reasons and every other reason so i've seen a number of indie authors get extremely frustrated about this situation but when you follow through on the conversation you actually discover they don't have a plan themselves for how they would actually sell their rights they don't necessarily even understand how challenging selling rights is or how to go about it in, at all in any way and What's happening is that they're frustrated about where they find themselves with a the publisher and this, you know, they're kind of, everything is going in on, I could sell my rights if I had them back. But in actual fact, there's a lot of stress and a lot of time being wasted thinking about something that might be better spent writing a new book. Yeah, which is yours. Um, yeah, well, that's good. And I, I guess that email tactic 
at least should generate a response from the company who is just ignoring you in the first place so if you uh, if you threaten to start marketing them yourselves or whatever so yes and there are some terrible companies in this space you know there are some people who are really they're just hoovering up rights all over the place and they don't you know they they're buying you know a thousand kind of um writes to a thousand books knowing that just 10 of those are actually going to make them their money and they don't care that the other 990 just lie there you know so yeah be assertive around it but don't get caught emotionally in kind of fighting a battle that might be a very fancy form of resistance (laughs) to writing your next book (laughs) Exactly. Okay. And that sort of brings us back to the beginning, which is get the contract right in the first place, um, go in with your eyes open, do a course on negotiation, etc. Know it is what you're si- know what it is that you're signing, which is all all good advice. I really hope that's helped. I know it's uh, it, it it is. I mean, you say don't get emotional about it. People have obviously got themselves in a position where they do feel emotional emotional about it. The book is their baby, and uh, it's a. Uh, beyond arm's length from them so but i hope your advice has helped uh, those uh, couple of people who wrote in and asked uh, for you to address that so orna we, we clocked up half an hour quicker than you can and neither of us have melted so far today so um <laughs> gotta say thank you very much indeed so it's allianceindependentauthors.org if people want to go along and uh, join the organization and we do advise as you get your organization going you get your first book published that you do join Orna's organization because it is something that's looking out for you and doing a lot of work in the background we all feel the benefit of it but it's it's a bit like a union I guess it's important to support it right thank you James thanks very much and yeah I hope it helped yeah definitely indeed have a good rest of the day I want to thank you for joining us thank you take care So although it's quite complicated, um, and it's as Orna was explaining, it's quite bitty. There's not as if you can go to one organisation and say, well, can you sell my rights abroad? You have to do a lot of individual deals. You could also look at it as money left on the table if you don't approach it at all, if you just write off because of that complexity, you don't do it at all. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of different ways to do it. I mean, for me, it's my agent handles all that for me. So I, you know, I don't need an agent to to publish my stuff um but it's an agent is very useful for the things that i'm not um, expert enough or i don't have time to learn how to do i could learn how to sell rights into germany but i don't speak german so that's a problem and um, i don't know about the german uh, publishing industry so that's another problem whereas my my agent does know that and they go to london book fair there's a massive rights um scrum um, on one of the floors over the, the two or three days where deals are being done and through that, I've sold um, rights to, to a big German publisher, to an Italian publisher to the, in the Czech Republic, other bits and pieces. And then there's also things like film deals, um, which are, are very arcane, even for someone with a legal background like me. It's, it's still um, learning how to negotiate a film deal and some of the really bizarre language involved and the acronyms and things like that that just don't make sense to me. Um, and I don't have time really to, to teach myself how to, how to do that. An agent can do that too. So there are, there are lots of different ways to, to get into that kind of, um, that kind of market. But I mean, you're right. It is, if you don't do it, you are potentially leaving quite a lot of money on the table. Um, and one of the things I'm very keen to do is to make sure that once I've got um, an asset, so in this case, a book, I'm going to sweat that asset as much as I can and sell, um, a, as much of the intellectual property translation, for example, film rights, as I can. And, um, you know, luckily enough, I've got a good agency to, to help me do that. Exploit your assets is a, uh, an important thing to do in business. Absolutely, yeah. I, I, I so that's, so that's like a novel title as well, maybe. It does. I'm just hoping we, not, we haven't put images into the uh, into the minds of people listening on, on the podcast uh, with James exploiting his assets. No. Okay, Um, thank you very much indeed with that imagery in your mind uh, for listening for this week. Always uh, great to have Orna Ross on and we want to say thank you to her as well. Do sign up, go and find independent uh, Alliance of Independent Authors online and join the organisation if you so wish, we uh, would encourage it. Okay, so we've got a really good uh, interview coming up next week with an editor. So we're going to, the mysterious world of editing, we're going to really dissect what makes a story work in fact, 
I can tell you now, at the end of that interview, I realised that there were probably a series of interviews we could do with Jenny Parrott, who's the editor we're speaking to next week. And we did a bit of an all-encompassing one next week, but I would like to perhaps uh, sit down with Jenny and produce something uh, more in-depth over time. She's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So that's to look forward to next Friday. Until then, have a good week writing, good week selling, and we'll speak to you then. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast. Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes, and links on today's topics. You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.